it has been said that McBride died like a hero, but that his heroic image has been tarnished because he had the misfortune to have as his rival in love our most celebrated poet, W.B. Yeats. Nobody has done more to restore his, his good name than Anthony Jordan. In his five books on McBride, he has shown how, his, how he has been wronged by a, by a number of writers over the years. This exhibition would not have been possible without his expert, expertise and the material he has collected. He was born in, in Ballyhonest. He has written biographies of Winston Churchill, Sean McBride, Christy Brown, as, as, as well as, as all the major studies on, on uh, John McBride. He's only going to speak this evening for a few minutes as he's, as he's delivering a lecture on, on McBride on Saturday evening in, in, in Westport Quay Community Centre. So I'm delighted to welcome the leading expert on, on McBride, Anthony Jordan. Mm. Gurmil Mahagal, to an ahas or on the on show new, on on Taspontas show alone show. Ladies and gentlemen, I would just like to say a few words about Major John McBride, and specifically about the people and the caliber of people whom he encountered in his during his life, and people who supported him. They give you an idea of the caliber of the man. Uh, I am, have been writing for the last 27 years about John McBride, following on from the first article written about him in Coroner Mart by the late Owen Hughes. Arthur Griffith was an intimate friend of John McBride. President Kruger agreed that McBride would organize an Irish Transvaal Brigade to fight in the Boer War. Members of of the Irish Parliamentary Party, including John Dillon, <coughs> Willie Redmond, subscribed to McBride's uh, brigade. Uh, Michael Davitt visited him out in South Africa. <coughs> Two ladies named Alice Milligan and Alan jo Alla, Alla Johnson of the Shan Van Vogt were major supporters of John McBride. I have had some magic moments researching the McBride story one of which was Anna Johnson. She wrote the song, L Roddy McCarley, you might know. I read about her that she had written a, 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 book, a, a letter to John McBride on St. Patrick's Day, 1900, when he was out in the Boer War. And I went into the National Library to see could I locate this. And eventually, after much research, I found the envelope and opened it and came across the letter, the loving letter that she had written to him, looking forward to his safe return from the, from the war. Obviously to me, a love letter. She was looking forward to him coming back. But there was another piece of paper in the envelope, and when I opened it, I discovered that it was the remains of the shamrock that she had sent him in 1900, and this was the year 1980. He had kept it all those years. Another person who influenced, who, who, whose influence uh, uh, was on John McBride was Roger Casement. It, it, it's not widely known that Casement met John McBride in 1913 in Dublin, and they had lunch together. And Casement had been in the diplomatic service in Portuguese East Africa during the Boer War and hadn't thought highly of McBride, naturally. But when they met in Dublin, they were amazed to discover that both their ancestors came from, from co co uh, side by side glens in, in County Antrim, McBride from Glen Shesk. And at that stage, Caseman was becoming an Irish nationalist, and he was intrigued by McBride. And one of the things that intrigued him was him setting up the Irish Brigade. And this led later to Caseman going to Germany and trying to emulate McBride and set up an Irish brigade among captured British soldiers. I could go on and on and on, but as Austin says, I'm talking in detail on Saturday night about these things. But there are a couple more people I want to mention. One is a lady called Jenny Wise Power. John McBride was, he was very attractive to women. He was very attractive to children. And during my research, I have been lucky enough to meet 
to, a, to meet one lady who knew him and remembered him well and told me about him, another man from Ballyhonis <coughs> who had known him and had written about him, and a, a Castle Bar man called Ernie O'Malley. And with your permission, I will just read some short extracts of what these people said about Major John McBride. A native of Ballyhonis County Mayo, Michael F. Waldron, a man I knew, who met the Major in connection with industrial development of the West, has written of him, and I quote, a thoughtful, prudent gentleman, broad-minded, and ready to make allowances for different of opinions, mild-mannered, courteous, and unassuming. The famous soldier gave the impression of having abundant force of character and reserve. He kept to the point at issue, clean-shaven, about middle height, rather sallow complexion, a keen, dark, lively eye that seemed to penetrate with one glance. John McBride's rapport with children has been reported by Ernie O'Malley, a fellow Mayo man whose family had moved to live in Dublin. O'Malley would become a legendary figure in later Anglo-Irish and civil wars. He wrote of McBride, being a frequent visitor to his childhood home, quote, he had been kind to us as children. He would leave the other visitors to talk with us. With him, we dropped our best company, manners, and felt at ease. Another contemporary witness is an Englishman, Dr. G. V. Malone Lee from Penner in Middlesex, who entered into correspondence with me in 1998. Malone Lee is a distant cousin of McBride through the Gill side of the family. He writes, I am now in my 93rd year. I remember meeting John McBride. He was very nice to children. I was staying with Molly Gill at a house on the Quay Westport. I have a very vivid flashback of John McBride visiting the house one day and having a bit of fun with us. He chased my sister, three years of age, Doreen, round the place, shouting, Thordum Pogue, Thordum Pogue, as she was running away from him. Apparently, it meant, give me a kiss. That must have been 1911, 86 to 87 years ago. There was something very nice about a man like that, light-hearted and good-natured. Lastly, can I say, because Major John McBride happened on the Easter Rising in St. Stephen's Green. A lot of people think that he was not in the loop of nationalists at the time. That is completely and utterly wrong. The reason Major John McBride, the main reason he was not part of the military council, because he was too well known to the authorities. If you're going to have a secret organization planning a rising, you don't include a person whom the police have been watching for the last 25 to 30 years. Last thing I say is, in September 1914, when the World War had started the month before, a meeting took place in the offices of the Gaelic League Society in Dublin. Present at it were the seven signatories of the proclamation, Arthur Griffith, Sean T. O'Kelly, William O'Brien, and Major John McBride. They decided at that meeting that a rising would take place under three conditions. If Germany invaded, if the war was to end, or if Britain was, was to become uh, antagonistic in Ireland. So John McBride was not out of the loop. He was there from 1914. And as we know, he was there to the bitter end and he died a heroic, a heroic death. And as I, I have a let, letter in today's paper, and it's a quote from a lady called Maury Colleen, and she says, his was the loneliest death of all. He was executed essentially for what he had done in South Africa 16 years ago, but with the younger men as he would have wished himself. <laughs>